Uh, we wanted to share some perspectives on kind of uh, what we've learned in this journey together uh, through OpenStack. What are we doing uh, with our clients and, and, and kind of you know, specifically some of the areas within OpenStack where we'll be uh, trying to contribute and, and help everyone kind of move, move the cause forward. Uh, there's a couple of people I just wanted to single out uh, because I probably will fall asleep. So Dave, Dave Linquist over here is going to present part of the presentation with me. Dave is, uh, is an IBM fellow and a CTO for cloud for uh, all of, of IBM. And uh, Todd Moore is our board member. You probably know him already. So if you've got any problems with the way OpenStack is behaving, just go to Todd <laughs> and he'll sort it all out. And, uh, and, and I, uh, I'm IBM's uh, vice president for all of our software standards in open source. Uh, as well as uh, our high performance cloud development labs in, in uh, Silicon Valley. So if you guys want to meet up out there in San Jose, let's do it, let's start. All right, so uh, let me get started. So I'd like to break this presentation into kind of maybe four moments or four sections, okay? Uh, you know, I, I get asked you know, to talk about, well, what is, you know, what is IBM's interests in OpenStack? You know, why did, why did you kind of you know, team up with a bunch of folks and help create this foundation? What are you trying to do? How are you trying to make money? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that. Uh, it's not my thing, I'm not a sales guy, but you know, I, I can give you some sense of strategy. Uh, but you know, I, I, I'd like to step back for a second and, and, and just take a moment for all of us to feel real good about where we are, right? If you, if you think about this, and for those of you who've been doing OpenStack for a long time, I've been watching the community from, a, from afar for a while, certainly so got quite engaged when we, when we helped start the foundation. But if you just look back at you know, the November Design Summit with 250 or so attendees, okay? I think maybe there was barely, you know, coffee was always kind of, you know, not enough coffee, you know, not as well, not as glamorous as this event, right? You look at the, uh, I don't know, look at the Cactus release with 100,000 lines of code, right? If you want these slides, I can get you the slides. You can take pictures too, but I can get you the slides. Um, you know, uh, hundred, and then you fast forward to today, right? We've got this event, Todd, what, 3,000, 4,000 or so people attending, right? We've got Grizzly with 800,000 lines of code, and this is just in two years, right? And it's really, it's really, really special that, that we've been able as a community to kind of accelerate this path, to kind of move forward, and specifically in Grizzly. I mean, Grizzly is just an amazing accomplishment in itself. I mean, 480 contributions, 45% increase from the Folsom release, and you look at the contributors, the wealth of contributors from us all. You know, IBM, you know, I, I always like to ask the teams, you know, Todd runs our cross IBM kind of open stack team, the, the folks who are focused internally in development or product, but also the, the community facing stuff, right? So that, we're consistent when we interact with everybody. Uh, I say, well, how are we doing? You know, are we, are things going well? How are we interacting? And, and uh, so we're number two in uh, code review. So I guess we like to complain a lot or comment a lot. That's pretty typical. But also number three in, in contributions. And I'm really proud of that. Because that, you know, that doesn't work when you try to just plop yourself in and say, hey, take this code. That works when you collaborate, when you have an open and kind of accepting and technical dialogue. That's how that works. That's something that Jonathan has always talked about as the OpenStack way, right? So I'd like to challenge you as we continue to get bigger, because <laughs> we will. <laughs> I never dreamed it would be this big, but as we continue to get more folks involved, you gotta remember that. You gotta remember, don't forget the OpenStack way, because that's what makes this community unique, and that's what makes it succeed. I mean, just today, uh, I saw that uh, Juniper and Ericsson signed up as two more gold members. It's exciting. These are big companies, exciting, doing interesting things, right? So it's, it's a really good time to be in this particular space and a really good time to be involved in OpenStack. You know, another really good chart if you want, if you send me a note, I'll send you this chart that we use a lot as we compare the growth of OpenStack to that of Linux. And in the early days, we always used to like to compare ourselves to Linux. Well, we've actually overtaken Linux in terms of how many active developers and how big the ecosystem is. And the growth has just been amazing, right? So, so it's kind of becoming an entity in itself. So the second point I want to make is to just kind of step back for a moment and think, well, why is interoperability or why is having kind of a de facto 
infrastructure as a service platform important to our clients, how we view things. And I think you'll view the story in a very similar way. And it's, it's pretty simple, right? I mean, do you guys uh, remember kind of the first time you, I think a lot of you do, you don't look that young. You know, you, when, you, when you kind of opened up a web browser and you, you know, Mozilla or whatever, you're like, wow, check this out. There's a picture with text around it and you can <laughs> click and oh, it goes forward. And when I hit back, it kind of goes back to where I was. This is interesting, right? And, and then, and what happened? Now, why did that work, right? Why did that all that work, right? Uh, it didn't work because IBM was trying to make products or, or, or anyone else. That's not the reason that worked, right? It worked because it was a combination of good open source and standards, right? Uh, and the fact that the communities were open and that vendors realized that you needed to have interoperability at the right places, right? Every web server today, whether it's IBM's or whoever else, ships with the Apache HTTP code in it. It does to this day. So now you don't have to worry about when you click, you know, give me a page, HTTP colon, you know, whatever.com. It's the same code. And that's the effect we want to have in cloud. And what happened, right, when we did that? The markets grew. Our clients didn't feel like anyone was trying to lock them in. They had the ability to integrate heterogeneous sets of web application servers as they deliver stuff to their clients, right? This is the same kinds of things. As markets grow faster, skills become more you know, relevant, more easy to obtain. I know right now everyone wants OpenStack skill and you know, we just, it's, it's crazy where you get OpenStack. This is just gonna continue, okay? And it's gonna be as pervasive as it is with CSS or JavaScript, right? You guys ever write CSS? I hope, yes. I, I help write that spec. It's very good, it's a nice spec. You know, there's, there's, you know, it will become pervasive as that. Uh, now, another thing that we do uh, is we also do a lot of survey of our clients. We ask them, you know, what are some of the things that that are important for you as you look at your businesses. And there's two points I want to make real quick. The first one is that uh, CEOs found that technology, for the first time ever, is going to play the number one role in their business. That's pretty cool. So we should all, as you know, as fellow developers or I like to call ourselves nerds, <laughs> we should feel pretty good about that. But a close number two is people skill. This is interesting because these things typically don't come hand in hand. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, right? So, so, but this is an important, and this is important for us, how we behave in OpenStack, how we behave in our organizations, and how we behave holistically. Now think about it, right? You all might be an expert in, you know, Swift, Nova, Cinder, whatever, right? You know, you know your thing, you're doing your stuff. But you also need to understand how you fit into the context of the larger OpenStack kind of deployment. And within your companies, you need to understand you know, whatever it is you do, you're developing on a product or working on a solution for the client, you understand, what is your company trying to do? So what's, what's happening is that I think that developers who build these so-called T-shaped skills, the ability to know their thing, you're a network god, great. You know, god bless you, you know, <laughs> that's great. You know, you're a database person, wonderful. But you need to step up and understand the context of what you live in. If we don't do that as a community in OpenStack, right, we won't be able to have all these components working together and you won't be as successful in your own company. And by the way, the same thing holds for folks who, who, uh, uh, who run businesses, right? So for those of you here who are looking to kind of understand how to use OpenStack from a commercial perspective, you've got to understand the technology, right? And how it applies to what it is you're trying to do, right? Not just a buzzword. And, 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 and for IBM, you know, the reason that, that uh, cloud and cloud interoperability is so important is, is really simple. I mean, think about the markets that we're in. You happen to hold IBM stock, which probably a lot of you do without even knowing it, right? <laughs> you know, we focus on big data. We focus on mobile. We focus on lots of, you know, different social. All of these market segments put huge strains on our infrastructure. You know, all of the mobile devices, all of the, the transactions that are occurring. Uh, you know, 60,000, they, they say, cyber threat, uh, security threats happen a day or something like this. We have to manage them on. All of this will, you know, there's not enough compute power in the world <laughs> to handle all of this at all times. So you need to be able to be flexible in how you manage these situations. So cloud is a very fundamental technology for that. And no single vendor, I mean, I'm certainly not arrogant enough to think that we can supply this to everybody, right? Um, no single vendor can do that. You need to be able to allow folks to be able to handle whether they're running a cloud on their private environment, whether they're using a public cloud or whether they have some integrated system or some kind of combination of these, you need to give them the ability to move around. 
And that is why I think, frankly, that OpenStack and what we're doing in cloud has the ability to be much more impactful than, than uh, say, the internet was in the e-business days, right, back when we were doing that stuff. And it's very different. It's very, very different. You know, back then, it was a bunch of us sitting in a room, writing specs, writing code, not really interacting with users that much. Does anyone know what the use case was for, for XML? You, does everybody know what XML is? Yeah? Okay. Well, it was the mathematical markup language. I co-chaired that, all right? It's a great use case, dude. I love math. I love computing. It's wonderful. And by the way, for distributed systems, let me tell you, that's a great use case. Doing some ball computation and lots of machines. You need lots of machines for that, right? Not the best use case for config files, would you say? No, probably not. <laughs> But, that, but that's different about OpenStack, and that's different about what's happening today, right? End users are really involved in the definition of what we all do. So as a community, right, uh, we need to continue to embrace end users. And that's something that OpenStack has always done, something that we, IBM, thought was very attractive when, when we kind of started to kind of get even more involved. And it's something that we must continue to do. Uh, and, you know, and, and this technology impacts, you know, more than what you all think, right? A lot of you, you know, kind of may, may, may spend your time with what people call, you know, platform engineering departments or you know, data center departments, right? Whatever you want to call it, right? We spend time in those areas. But, you know, this technology impacts the real world. I'll give you kind of a real example that, that I kind of ran across. And that is, uh, I'll give you one. And, and that's a, a hospital in, uh, in Canada where they uh, work with essentially, you know, really, really sick children, okay? And these, 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 these kids go in there. And basically, uh, their vital signs can change within a day and, and, and have the you know, possibility of dying the next day. So you have basically a 24-hour window of correlating all this stuff, understanding what's happening, and then do some action so they don't die. That's basically it. It's a huge analytics problem, right? And by the way, they can't solve it. You know, a human can't solve it, right? It's just too much for any human to understand all these vital signs, right? And by the way, no single hospital has enough compute power to handle all of what they need to be doing. So they use the cloud, right, uh, to manage and be able to scale their, their infrastructure. But guess what? You know, these guys are saying, well, you know, I need to have interoperability to be able to run my application, my workloads, in different <coughs> clouds. What if someone goes down, right? Or what if, you know, I can't afford this cloud and I need to move to another, right? That's a real example of where, and by the way, of course, they're looking at OpenStack and other things, right? You know, so this is just a real example of how this stuff, stuff touches up. So you should always think about kind of the art of possible. Now, moving to reality, though, the clients that we serve, and certainly the clients that you serve, probably, spend 70% of the time managing their existing systems so, you know, and, and their money. So they've got about 30% to handle new applications. So where does like the innovation come in? <laughs> you know, wh wh where do I start playing with OpenStack and, and, and sort of you know, stand this thing up and, and start doing DevOps and you know, continuous delivery and all that stuff? You know, where, do, where does that happen, right? How do you manage that? So as a community, we also need to be very cognizant, you know, cognizant. It's, it's in the afternoon, I'm tired. The cognizant of, 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 you know, where our client, where the reality is, how, the, how their, their current operating environment, right? So that when we think about uh, introducing OpenStack, we do that in a way that allows it as easy as possible for them to introduce that technology, to wrap what they have, whether it's KVM, VM, whatever, right, which we do, right, with as least pain as possible and, 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 at least, and, and the most advantage uh, that, that they can. All right, so that's your gentle kind of introduction. Is that good? I saw some guy sleeping over here, so wake up. I don't know who it was. Fair enough, not be in my team. Let's take note of who's sleeping. Um, so what's our strategy with OpenSec? You guys ready? Yeah, write the tweet, you know. Here we go. Yeah, IBM strategy. We want OpenStack to be the ubiquitous infrastructure as a service platform, period. That's it. That, there it is, in a nutshell. Why? For all the things I just told you about, but that's our objective, right? When, when, uh, when we gotten all together and we, were, and we were working with a small group of us talking about you know, establishing a foundation and how do we kind of get folks, I was real upfront. That's what we want. Why do we want it? I, I, because I want the e-business effect for cloud, right? It, it is about peace, love, and OpenStack to a certain degree. It's also about peace, love, and growing markets so we can make more money, 
all right? <laughs> that works too, right? I like nice cars, you know? So, so, uh, so that's what we want. It's very clear. So how do we do that? And I'm going to take a moment to talk about some of the things that we're doing. I'll get into specifics and with Dave will we'll help me here. Uh, around development, some of the code areas, some of the areas that we've contributed to Grizzly, some of the areas that we think are important as you look at Havana, right? Um, also, it's important what we do with clients. And I'll talk a little bit about you know, some of our product offerings and, 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 and how we think kind of the OpenStack references will start to kind of increase dramatically soon as well. From our, at least we'll help that from our perspective. Um, also, ecosystem. The ecosystem, you know, end users is a real big part of this. I'll talk a little bit about that. And let's not forget this. You know, as much as I started this conversation as we should feel good, right, you can't stop training, right? You can't stop evangelizing. You cannot stop showing the value you get from OpenStack and getting input and, and morphing, right? So being active, all of us in the press and the analysts and helping folks understand that can be critically important. You can't rest because, you know, something else might happen, right? And we all have a vested interest in OpenStack. So let's start uh, on the development side. And Dave, you can just maybe tell us a little bit about kind of what we've been doing here. Sure, just a couple of comments. Thanks, Angel. Um, first of all, as Angel mentioned, our, our objective strategically is really to do anything it takes in this community to make OpenStack a de facto infrastructure as a service. That's what we're focused on. It's a, it's a great community. Um, it's been very exciting for all the folks uh, in our organizations to be participating in this community. It's been very collaborative, extremely productive. Um, as you can imagine, we have a large number of developers uh, working across the breadth of, of projects in, in OpenStack. And one of the questions that we frequently get with uh, large numbers of enterprises and service providers are, what are, what, what are some of the contributions that you're working on um, from an IBM perspective? What are some of the things, the priorities in the community? Um, is it ready? Is it ready for my data center? Is it ready for, for an enterprise deployment? And a few things that always come up in, in those types of deployments are one is, Post the deployment, how do I take care of the system? How do I upgrade the system? How do I patch the system? How robust is it? How well is it going to scale? How well is it going to recover? What's the security model like? What's the logging like? What's the auditing like? Those are many of the core things that enterprises and providers alike push, push, push hard. So I can't emphasize enough, I think, as a community, how important it is for us to focus on these areas to really accelerate and drive the adoption and to drive this as a de facto open infrastructure as a service. A couple of the areas that I just wanted to highlight, some of the things that we've been working together in the community on, in particular, are upgrading the system. How can we make this less and less obtrusive, more and more of a very seamless live upgrade in particular? Security, security and authentic authentication. This comes up everywhere. How do we fit with a lot of the existing security models, a lot of the authentication models? How do we bring in things like LDAP more appropriately into, in, into, into the security systems within OpenStack? Member services. Um, this, to me, is just the beginning of how we instill more and more of the critical engineering aspects of a distributed system into OpenStack, into what OpenStack is. Uh, in particular, how we understand state, how we sync up the distributed components, how we can then start moving more and more to a more recoverable, recoverable-oriented model within, within that system. And a couple other areas that I want to emphasize in the worldwide um, deployment, obviously globalization is critical. That's an area where we use extensive reach in our labs uh, to really get more and more of the translation going uh, for OpenStack. And also quality. Quality is critical to use cases, what we drive through this uh, system and how we can get it, how we can just keep accelerating the level of quality of OpenStack. So those are some of the core areas that we as an organization have, particip have been participating in. There are many, many areas, but those are the ones I wanted to highlight. Um, moving forward, a couple of areas come to mind that 
um, in particular, I'd like to see a little more emphasis from our organization on, and, and, and from the community. One is in the whole area of metering and monitoring. One of the things that many of you, I'm sure, recognize, but what's so important after a deployment of a cloud-like environment is really how you deal with it through its life cycle. How do you bring in many of the management systems into this, into this environment to keep the system running healthy so you can see how it's running, you can take actions, you can run it through various change release management type, type, up, type updates. So that's a very critical area. Another critical area that you're seeing a lot of focus on across the industry is in this broad term that's often referred to as orchestration. I encourage you to think about orchestration at three different layers. Think about orchestration at a resource layer. How do I rapidly pull together the resources and the topologies and the configurations I need uh, to support the workload, the application I'm, I'm deploying down on this? Second area is in the workload orchestration. How do I understand the workload? How do I understand what are the right optimization points for this workload as I orchestrate laying that down? So that's the workload orchestration. And the third area is really in more, what's often referred to as a service orchestration. Really think about how do you manage the applications and the services through their life cycle, from deployment to activation, to change, release, problem management, all the pieces you have to do to keep the system running through its, through, through its, through its full life cycle. So those are core areas in addition to the other ones that I spoke about that we as a community and as, an, as a developers in IBM will continue to focus on. Really in support of that objective, how do we make this enterprise ready, provider ready, robust, de facto infrastructure as a service? Angel? Thanks, Dave. So let's talk about ecosystem now, okay? And uh, by the way, I got a little demo too, so that will actually wake you up. Give you Angel, is Andrew here? There you are. Right, any questions, by the way, on, on all things, go to Andrew. None of us, no, we're not allowed questions. My handlers won't allow that. <laughs> I wish I had handlers, like an entourage, you know? Wouldn't that be nice? Anyway, uh, so ecosystem, you know, end user input and feedback into what we do is real important, right? I think increasingly so as we get larger and larger. There's, a, there's been a big focus uh, in, in the user committees to, to start to do that. There's a variety of end user organizations out there. We should go and interlock with them, right? Take this one, this Cloud Standards Customer Council. We've got 400 end users involved. They've been writing use cases for interoperability around infrastructure as a service, around platform, you know, lots of different areas. Uh, these are people who use the stuff. And I gotta tell you, you know, when you have someone like, say, Kroger, this is a, a Kroger is a supermarket chain, for those of you who know that, and, and then Boeing, right? Airplanes, right? Together, talking about SLAs or security, it's mind-numbing. <laughs> because talk about use cases from opposite ends of the spectrum, right? But they come together and they kind of carve out what they think really matters in kind of more generic form. Understanding that as you all in your project, as project leaders or, or you know, contributors in your project, understanding those use cases is critical. So that's an area I think we've got to continue to do more work on. All of us should be doing as much as we can around outreach to the media, press, and analysts. I mean, all of us in our own companies have ways of doing that. All of you in your blogs and your tweets, I encourage you to do more, <laughs> okay? Because the more you do, the more people get awareness, they understand what's happening, the more they feel connected, the more they understand how to get connected. A couple of months ago, IBM did a, a big announcement around kind of an open architecture for cloud that we kind of said that, look, all of our products and, and, and offerings, which I'll talk about here in a moment, are based kind of an, on an open cloud architecture, where obviously OpenStack is a big part of that. There's other things, which I'll, I'll talk to a little bit later, but, but OpenStack is a huge part of that. And that, you know, to me, it was somewhat obvious. <laughs> You know, that we were doing that. But that generated a lot, of, a lot of buzz in the media, which I guess is good. And it's certainly good for OpenStack, right? And, and, uh, and, and that's the kinds of things that I think you guys should, should encourage your, 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 your folks to go do when, when, when you go do that. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about our offerings and, and then kind of, you know, so how do, we, how do we sell or how do we try to make money and how do we help our clients with OpenStack? And let me just start here for a moment. I think I should have reversed this. So there's really three ways to do this. So we don't, you know, we don't have an OpenStack distribution. We're not, uh, you know, like a Red Hat or something like that. You know, that's not our business. 
we want to very much do kind of what we did with the business days, which is take the code and put it inside of our offering so that we have interoperability at the infrastructure as a service uh, layer. That's what we do. Uh, when it comes to cloud, there's really three ways that our clients uh, have the ability to get cloud technology. They can have a private cloud, so we call this our smart cloud foundation, so software you do, we install it. Uh, in fact, our first installment, our first kind of payment on this vision was that we've announced that, uh, uh, that, that the smart cloud orchestrator, which is now in beta, and you can go get, uh, ships with OpenStack in it. Uh, and it will be uh, released any day now, right, Andrew? Any day now. Okay, very good. My team is helping them, so they say it's any day now. All right. And uh, the, the, other, uh, the, other, uh, the other product offering is our integrated system. We call it Pure Systems. It's the combination of hardware and software. Uh, that runs our Smart Cloud Foundation. So as you can imagine, uh, when we update that to the latest version of Smart Cloud Foundation, there'll be OpenStack in there as well. And then of course, our, our public cloud, Smart Cloud Enterprise for enterprises, for large enterprises. Uh, that has our Smart Cloud Foundation on it as well. Uh, our private cloud, our Smart Cloud Foundation has about 5,000 or so clients right now. They're not all using OpenStack, so don't say Angel said there's 5,000. But when they start to upgrade, which they all do, right? You'll we'll start to get uh, OpenStack embedded in more and more places, which is great, which is great. The more user stories we can have, uh, the better, right? So specifically, and, and Dave talked about this, orchestration at the resource layer, at the workload, at the service layer, this is kind of what we're doing with the Smart Cloud Orchestrator. I'm gonna give you a little demo. It's a movie, but it's, it's real. Uh, they actually uh, <laughs> recorded it live on, uh, I think it was Friday. So, uh, so it's not entirely clean here, but I think we'll give you a taste. Uh, if you want to go deeper, uh, you know, Andrew and the guys are at our little booth and they can kind of go into all of the details and, and show you this. But first of all, when you think about orchestration, you know, there's lots of ways, you know, whether it's at deploying OpenStack, setting up clouds, whether it's, it's, it's you know, dispensing the workloads that run on those particular VMs, or whether it's integrating into your existing environment, monitoring tools, your, your ticket management systems, all the things that happen when you really deploy this stuff, right? You know, there's lots of ways of doing it, right? You can write scripts, you can use Chef, you do all kinds of things. But, you know, at the end of the day, you want to be able to understand those workflows, okay? And to be able to have patterns of those things that you use across all of these different layers. And that's what we allow folks to do. We allow them to start to define these, these kind of, you know, workflows of workflows, right? So they can start to easily provision things. And this happens to be one uh, around provisioning um, a, uh, an OpenStack uh, uh, cluster. Uh, so the user's gonna go over and do a provisioning request. They're gonna select an operating system. They're gonna say Red Hat and use some VMware. This should be pretty familiar that, you know, so say it's gonna be a large, you know, kind of a, a node that we need, right? And it's gonna say, poof, please, you know, create one of these for me. We also kind of had it uh, use uh, some, one of these patterns. Okay, and I'll get more into the patterns in a second, but it's essentially going to create two VMs, and on each VM, you're going to have uh, some different software that's going to get laid out on it, okay? So we go off and we say, yeah, can you please, uh, you know, put this software on here as well? And you submit, and it'll say, yeah, we did that. Uh, there's different ways of, of getting uh, kind of notified uh, when stuff happens. It can send you an email, uh, you know, text to your phone, activity stream into your Facebook stream, whatever, right? There's lots of different ways of getting no notified. And this is an important point we'll make later. Uh, so when you kind of peer into this, uh, what you actually do is you'll see, I'm gonna go back here, you'll see what's actually running. So that looks better here than it does. I can't see it the way it looks on my screen. It looks much better. Here you have on one, you have a Java run, you got Zookeeper, and you got Tem. Tem is typically endpoint manager, okay? On this other one here, you've got Java, Tomcat, and some Tem, Tem as well. So that's a pattern that was deployed into these images, okay? So it's pretty easy to do. It's certainly, you know, if you think about what you go through doing this, if you don't have a visual composition tool, it's kind of painful. And we also think about kind of the robustness of kind of trying to manage and maintain all of these different scripts behind here. It becomes a little hard to manage. And so we're trying to make it easier for folks to stand up their environments and kind of get going. Uh, you also have the ability to kind of, uh, you know, once you have these things deployed, you know, add more servers, more resources. Uh, so, you know, in this case here, the guy said, look, I need uh, another node. They're actually gonna add a KVM-based one in this case here, just so you can show KVM and, and VMware kind of working uh, side by side. 
And then I think you kind of get this little standard screen. Here it sends an email, but when you click on the link, you get a screen that shows you the two servers running, right? Quite interesting. So now let's step back here and let's look at actually how these patterns were created. Okay, I'm gonna walk through the creation of one of these little patterns so that, that runs the workload that sits on top of the OpenStack deployed uh, images, right? And uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to ops code here and download a chef recipe. It could be anything, okay? It could be any other of your favorite type of way of doing this. We haven't do chef. We're gonna do, uh, we're gonna go and we're gonna download the Apache HTTP recipe, okay? So we go, we download it, we save it, and we go into the tool and say, let's create a new pattern. And this pattern is gonna use the chef recipe, okay? So we import it uh, into the pattern uh, machine and we kind of then say, okay, let's, uh, let's execute this pattern. And, uh, and, and before we do that, we gotta associate or bind, as you can see, the chef recipe into the pattern. So we just do a little drag and drop on all the different kind of scripts we have. It plops in and then we say deploy. And when we deploy it, it's gonna ask you, because you know, the chef recipe requires some configuration to stand up, right, the Apache HTTP, it needs port numbers and all kinds of interesting things. Uh, after you kind of put that information in, which kind of happens right around here, you go and you're happy. You have your, your chef guy, it's all up and running, okay? I went through it quickly, but you get a taste, right? Orchestration at the resource layer with OpenStack, right? At the, uh, at the layer of the workloads and the layer of the services integrating into your existing environments. And then the ability to kind of create these, these, uh, these uh, recipes on your own. And it's, and it's just, you know, the, the fact that we're building this on OpenStack and the fact that we're trying to make it easier for clients to leverage and use OpenStack in their existing environments, like I said before, right, is something that really kind of resonates with a lot of the clients that, that, that we talk to. All right, so now I'm gonna hand it back to Dave because I want us now, so that's been, you know, the, the good news, right? Kind of what IBM's doing and trying to help and kind of where we're headed. Uh, now let's, let's kind of take a moment. I want you to open your minds a little bit right, kind of go down the OpenStack way. And let's, take a, let, let's think about where the industry's headed from an open cloud architecture. And what are other things we might want to think about even further down the line? Hey, Angel. I'm not sure how far in the future much of what I'm gonna go through is, um, but let's talk it through. Uh, we're seeing a lot of this occurring today you saw glimpses of it, I think, this morning at the keynote. Um, what I'm talking about is a few layers that appear to be naturally emerging through patterns that we're seeing um, across a wide variety of industries, from retail to insurance to financial services to banking to telcos, um, healthcare, et cetera. I, I, I see this going on. And what I'm talking about is, is from a business perspective, from a line of business, from a business unit, how is cloud, cloud computing being used to drive revenue, to close gaps and drive revenue? What a lot of these businesses call driving, uh, really driving their innovation. And what you see going on, and you saw some examples of it from the speakers this morning, from Comcast, from Bloomberg, from uh, Best Buy, and there are many, many examples, targeted pieces are coming, but you can start feeling this coming together as patterns. From the business unit, um, from a, almost from an app dev team and a business unit, what you're trying to do is really accelerate the rate and pace with which you can tr close gaps and drive new opportunities to market, new applications, new business models, new business processes. And the approach that this is often taking is one in which using mobile mobile devices for reach, using social for a very compelling interaction, using big data, business analytics to really begin to target, to better understand your customers, to better understand what products make sense, services for those customers, or how to, how to extend that base. Also how to better interact with your partners, also along with, along with employees. And the methodology behind this, in this rapid creation, is one in which you, you're start in, starting to see how the environment of the, what's often referred to as a PaaS layer is being dynamically composed. You're composing what development tools you want to use, like repositories and testing tools and build tools. 
you're composing what the application containers are going to be, whether they're uh, scripting languages, Python, Ruby, et cetera, with messaging systems, with data persistent systems, with operational management systems for visibility into how this application is running. All that then deployed on an infrastructure as a service. What this affords is a very rapid creation of environment, very rapid creation of this application, and incremental continuous delivery. This is what businesses across all industries are driving towards. Then what this composition is occurring is the composition of those services that I mentioned across dev, app, data, a lot of business services in there, a lot of back-end transactional systems in there, data sources. That middle layer, the focus is on how do I support these services in a manner, manage these services in a manner to support this composition and this rapid and high-scale delivery into this mobile social environment with this big data. So there, a lot of the energy is, that, is on this orchestration uh, technologies. In particular, this managing it through its surface, service, you know, managing this life cycle, and that workload layer. How can I model the workloads? How can I become aware of what I should be monitoring and getting visibility into that workload? How do I optimize how that workload is running? So that's that middle layer. Then that lowest layer is how do I drive this, these workloads, on a software defined environment, in particular an infrastructure as a service. How do I run this against the software defined environments of compute, storage, and networking? So when you map that back through a lot of the initiatives in the industry, you see a couple of things surfacing very rapidly. Obviously at that lowest layer, the core is, the open, is, is, is OpenStack. And we'll see more and more industry momentum and in how more and more of these core projects increasingly become service level abstractions, increasingly have more and more um, interfaces to recognize what are the policies and configuration and, and, and operational management of those underlying, underlying abstractions. That middle layer, a lot, of, a lot of focus in the industry now on specifications to how to understand how to model what that workload is. That's where we're seeing a lot of work in Oasis around things like Tosca. A lot of work starting to emerge in, in uh, projects here and heat and basically almost a resource level orchestration. So that's, that's the area that we're going to see a lot more standards and open source filling in. That top layer, this composition of services, this continuous delivery, this how do I pull together my dev tools with my operational tools with my uh, runtimes of app data messaging. Here, what we're seeing is a lot of focus on how you properly represent these services and what it means to configure and manage these services and bring them together in a life cycle. I encourage, if you haven't done, to look at, look at some of the architectures and the standards in linked data, something Tim Berners-Lee has been pushing in W3C, where it really opens up the data and the interfaces and capabilities across systems and they basically using web protocols. And then what, what us and many others are doing is in, within a community referred to as OSLC, Open Services for Lifecycle Collaboration, is how do you take that architecture, that linked data architecture, and apply it to the different domains of automation, of problem management, request management, et cetera, so that you can begin to federate tools to manage that composition of services, that rapid composition that's occurring in support of that business objective of really driving new services, new apps, new data to market. Okay? So that's, that's how the layers we see evolving in, in patterns. And so when we talk about an open cloud architecture, what we're really referring to is those three layers of that underlying infrastructure with OpenStack, of the workload modeling, a lot of that work going in Oasis, and of uh, that upper layer uh, with W3C and the OSLC community in managing through the life cycle. So as I mentioned uh, in Oasis, one of the key standards that we're looking at is this, is goes by the acronym of TOSCA, which is really topology and orchestration specification. Here's where you model the workload, the topology, the nodes and the relationships, and then you 
create plans that co correspond with that workload. How do I deploy it? How do I activate it? How do I add or remove nodes? How do I put it into high availability mode, a backup recovery, security, et cetera? So think about that as a workload uh, layer orchestration <coughs> with an open specification that will create a level of portability really enabling hybrid clouds to interact from a customer perspective on push, putting down workloads. And then the third area I mentioned was with linked data and OSLC. To me, we're really just beginning to see the power of this type of technology, this type of architecture in particular, and how it begins to open up access to data in these systems. How I can federate uh, information across these systems. If you've ever put together complex um, management systems, you quickly recognize that the data integration problem is quite daunting. And this, this is true in, in, in most application architecture designs is that data integration becomes quite daunting. And this approach, rather than trying to coalesce on comma schemas or um, moving large amounts of data or doing API level integration, you're really federating just the way the web works in access into information and access into and various capabilities. And it allows you to create a very loosely coupled system that you can very rapidly compose the services across and take care of that, take care of that integration through that type of a loose coupling, that federation approach. And so that's what we're driving in communities is how do we appropriately use linked data in these different in these various domains. Angel? Great, thanks, Dave. So uh, let me just close out with a couple of thoughts. I think we're up to the hour. So first of all, this is going to be an interesting ride. We're just at the beginning, right? You know, cloud is at really, frankly, at its infancy. OpenStack is still at its infancy. For those of us who've been with OpenStack for the past couple of years or even longer, it seems like a hiking trip. You know how when you're on a hiking trip, you, you're excited in the first kind of 10 minutes, and then 10 minutes in, your backpack gets heavy. It's not so exciting, <laughs> right? But then you reach the top of the hill, and it's exciting again, right? But then 10 minutes later, it's no longer exciting. That's the way it's going to be. So just get ready for that. It's going to be ups and downs. But you know we'll get there together, right? So there's a couple of, uh, couple of takeaways. So if you're a user of OpenStack in here, you, know, you all really will determine our destiny. I mean, that's been the OpenStack way, and I think it will continue. So get involved in the OpenStack user committee. Get involved in. And, and user advocacy groups and start getting those use cases well understood. Help us understand how we can do the right thing for you all as we continue. If you're a developer, okay, especially those who've been here a while developing, right, continue to be open-minded and inclusive. There's lots and lots of new blood here. I mean, I've met so many new folks who kind of, you know, want to be contributors and, and kind of excited, right? Continue to, to hug those new people and bring them in, okay? Bring them in. Uh, because the, the power of innovation that we all have when we collectively work together is just amazing. So don't, don't change that. Uh, bring your power bars, as I said. You're going to need that for your hike. And look, we, we work with, uh, with all of you in so many different ways. And if, and if there's a way where we're not working with you and you'd like to work with us, you can reach out to us. Just call me, right? Call any of us, and we're happy to have a dialogue on how we can work together in the community to do good stuff, all right? So uh, thank you very much. Peace, love, and open staff.